All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Uh, I have some barking dogs behind me, which is just perfect for audio. I apologize. Um, that's that's just the nature of uh, these sessions. My name is Ontario Garcia. I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. I have one of the coolest and nerdiest jobs in that I get to study gaming and literacy and civic identity of young people, and I prepare teachers. Uh, and so it's a real privilege to get to be in conversation with all of you today. Um, before we begin, I'm going to go through the spiel of some housekeeping notes just to make sure uh, everybody's on the same page. Uh, so as you can see, chat's enabled. I see some of you are saying where you're joining from. I said I'm from um, I'm at Stanford, but I'm actually down in Pasadena, California right now. Um, hi, Carol. Uh, and uh, so uh, please feel free to share reflections and thoughts throughout. We're going to be keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, and so if there's particular questions, we'll try to catch them. Um, we're we're going to do our best. There's a lot of you today. Um, we're at capacity for this Zoom. Um, so just to make sure that everyone's listening, we're also live streaming this on Facebook. Um, so hello to all of you in the, the metaverse, I think is what it's called nowadays. Uh, the recording of this event will be available in the next few days, and you're going to be able to access that at literacyworldwide.org backslash, backslash digital events. Lastly, if you're tweeting, um, hello, Elon, please remember to tag ILA at ILA today and use the hashtag, hashtag ILA webinar. Um, without further ado, I'm excited to, to acknowledge the other presenters today. Um, Stefan McNinch, Liz Simpson, and Cade Wells. We're going to hear from all of them momentarily. Um, but first, I think we're going to start with a video um, from uh, Zach Clay uh, on uh, uh, some of the work around D&D. Okay, as we get this, maybe maybe as we get this started, um, hopefully the video will come back. But as we're doing that, maybe we'll start with, with the introductions um, just to keep us moving forward. Uh, so as I said, uh, I am uh, I'm a second level associate professor. Uh, I, I cast cantrips to publish peer reviewed art journal articles and to keep away peer reviewer two, uh, who oftentimes tries to uh, send banish my articles um, to the abyss. Uh, but I've, I'm a former high school English teacher and I've spent a long time um, developing games for my classroom. I've created alternate reality games. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what D&D &D means and, and what it looks like. Dungeons and Dragons, sorry, we're going to use lots of acronyms. We're going to be D&D &D and SEO and ILA, um, but we'll, for the first few times, we'll, we'll introduce them. So um, I've thought a lot about what Dungeons and Dragons looks like and what it means um, and spent um, a couple of years engaging in ethnographic field research, playing Dungeons and Dragons as the nerdiest research uh, that a professor gets paid to do. It was wonderful. Um, and so kind of acknowledging that I now kind of focus on preparing teachers and thinking about what this work means in terms of what happens in our classrooms. I'm going to hand it over to Stefan, if you can introduce yourself, and then hot potato it over to Liz. Hi, everyone. My name is Stefan. Um, my journey with D&D, actually, before that, I just want to say a big thank you to Angela and Becky at ILA for, for hosting and organizing this, and Shelly at Wizards of the Coast for, for sponsoring this, and just the visibility in general um, that you guys have created around uh, education, games, and education. Um, personally, my, my journey with Dungeons & Dragons started uh, as an elementary educator uh, for seven years in the special ed and third grade general ed classroom. And uh, uh, at the request of some students, I started a D&D after school club. Five years later, 50% of the kids in there were uh, some sort of special ed des designation accommodation. And it, it, that was my baptism into, into game design with education. And uh, the, the crown jewel of that was a entrepreneurship class uh, campaign that we did, which is to date the, the most fun D&D uh, &D campaign that I've played. And uh, I mean, we, we ran the gamut of that. Like, the kids started from, from start to scratch, a startup business. Uh, and then that trans transitioned into me going to school for game design development. And then for the last two years, I've been running a nonprofit after school program that expanded that into STEM, history, storytelling, SEL, and then our flagship entrepreneurs class. I'm Liz Simpson. Uh, all, all of the social media, I am librarian Liz. Um, I actually started with D&D &D, uh, from a very young age, uh, reading the uh, Dragonlance books far too early for what they are actually marketed for. I think I was about seven. Uh, I did my first uh, poetry contest, like when you're in early middle school, uh, with the Salamic Death chance and I have a, a Knights of Salamnia tattoo on my arm so you can tell where I got that but I didn't actually play D&D &D until I was 32 
So that was quite a big difference. Uh, it was always part of my life. So I just never thought that I was going to be able to get to play. And then 5e came around, uh, Critical Role came around. A bunch of my friends were like, why have you not played this yet? And forced me to play. And then I kind of haven't stopped. And now I teach middle schoolers uh, as a middle school librarian uh, and the uh, DM and uh, advisor for our Dungeons and Dragons club. Uh, and I also use a lot of the same uh, ideas of Dungeons and Dragons in various aspects of my teaching as well. I'm Cade Wells. Um, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for 32 years. I started at the age of 10 and the books at that time were actually marketed to 10 years old and up. Um, kind of came into my life randomly like it does for so many people. Uh, my imagination was absolutely ready for a platform upon which to operate because of that, up, that, up to that point, my imagination had no limits and therefore is relatively unusable. You got to figure out how to box that stuff in so you can actually use it. D&D became a platform of understanding for my imagination and uh, altered the course of my life forever. Um, for so many reasons, I've got friends of 22 years now that were college buddies, you know, freshman floor, uh, dorm room floor, found a player's handbook on a dude's coffee table. Hey, you want to play? We're friends to this day, 22 years later, just to show you the power that it has in terms of the friendships that come from playing it together. Um, I have been teaching for 10 years, uh, came into teaching non-traditionally, had every other job there was, and then decided that there was something far better that I could be doing with all of the experience and intellect that I possessed. So I started using D&D in the classroom um, almost immediately. Uh, I taught in Houston uh, Title I uh, for seven years, and uh, that's where I really noticed the socio-emotional learning, the reading, the, just the acquisition of literacy. I, I was literally able to watch the difference happen right before my eyes in a much quicker way than one would expect, even as an experiment. And so I just kept writing that experiment. Scores kept going up. Kids' behaviors became better. Um, better is a really light way of saying that. And then my wife and I moved home to be closer to friends and family home in South Dakota. And uh, now I teach the opposite end of that demographic. So I had Title I and now I have re relatively affluent children in advanced English. And um, my takeaway from that whole experience of 10 years of using D&D in a classroom is that it doesn't matter how bright, how poor, how rich, you know, whatever it is, the, the, the game has an amazingly powerful effect on everyone. I've seen it with myself. I've seen it with friends. I've seen it with students and children. And um, that's a really short synopsis of D&D use and, and my life where it came in and, and how it's used. My kids play every Friday in school. Awesome. Uh, so this is a very nerdy um, expert set of uh, panelists. I'm excited to kind of engage with all of you. I think we're going to try to give this video another go. Um, so I'm going I'm to make the awkward pause uh, and see, see if that happens right now. Hello, my name is Zach Clay. I'm a professional dungeon master and I help run an after school D&D club. Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop role playing game created back in the 70s that's really become the grandfather of a lot of modern role-playing games and video games. In Dungeons & Dragons, players gather around a table to tell stories, roll dice, fight monsters, and cast magic spells. One player takes the role of the Dungeon Master. They're the one that controls the world. They come up with the story and the monsters that the other players have to fight. One of my favorite aspects of DMing is building the world, creating characters and NPCs, and it's kind of like an outlet for all these ideas. The dragon will use its turn to dash. It's no longer really focusing on you, it's trying to get to the crater as fast as possible. The other players at the table each control their own character, a team that works together to help each other get through that dungeon or encounter or fight off the monster that's been put in front of them. Dragon falling from sky. Yeah, uh, you can see the dragon, and it's getting like larger every second. Oh, hold, no. hold on a moment, and I'm gonna zone out back to like the astral projection. Whether it's teamwork or collaboration, creativity, or even a bit of math, Dungeons and Dragons is the meeting point of all of these skills that these students work on every day. Something I really love in D&D is just doing all the math, honestly. A lot of this comes in handy for like classwork and homework, where I need to consider more than just the single option that I tend to just revert to. When I was in middle school and high school, there was no D&D &D club here. When I came back to the school as an educator, I decided to run sessions of D&D &D for the students 
Now we have this great club between both the middle school and the high school and an amazing creative outlet for these students. No matter what else is going on in the world around them, when a player comes to sit at the table, the rest of the world can disappear. You find yourself immersed in the story that's happening and playing a character that isn't yourself. You can take on a funny voice or become the hero in the story, and perhaps that's some of the best collaboration and creativity that they get to express even just in the short time that they sit at the table. You heal 11 hit points. Oh! I got into D&D, it's actually because of her actually. Just showed me some books, got me introduced to the characters, and from there I just kept on playing. <laughs> Once a person realizes that the main part of D&D is just sitting around a table with your friends, rolling dice and telling stories, it's pretty easy to get into. Awesome. We did it. We played the video. It worked. I'm feeling, I'm feeling optimistic. Everything, everything else can just go downhill from here. It won't. Uh, so I think I want to recognize there's been a lot of good and useful jargon that we've heard um, just through these introductions. Um, uh, so D&D obviously is Dungeons and Dragons. 5e, Liz mentioned 5e, that's fifth edition, although I think it's technically the 12th edition, but who's counting? Um, critical Role, uh, Dragonlands, NPCs. Uh, there's probably others that, that we'll think through. Um, so just to kind of get us all on the same page, I want us to figure out what do we mean by a role-playing game? What do we mean by Dungeons and Dragons? What does that look like? I'm going to offer a, a basic uh, definition of what D&D means for me. Um, we'll see if any of the panelists want to add to that, and then we'll jump into some conversation around emotional literacy. Uh, so at, at its very basic concept, at least for me, it's, it's many things, right? I think this is the, the kind of classic definition of pornography, right? I, you know it when you see it. This is the, the Supreme Court definition. Uh, this is not pornography, um, but the same kind of definition of, you know, a role-playing game, you know it when you see it. It could be anything. You make up the rules. Um, but for me, it really is a place where collaborative storytelling, we create a world together, and we then create and construct rules to explore and imagine what happens within that world and tell stories together, right? This is the, the, the beautiful capacity for me of D&D, is the ability to construct new possibilities and worlds. And particularly, we spent almost three years in a global pandemic uh, and in, in the world of educational reform, we've talked about kind of creating new worlds and new possibilities. D&D is exactly the place where that happens every single time you do it, right? Every single time, it's about imagining new possibilities. And when you think about young people, right? And we want, we want to empower young people to go out and make great changes in the world. D&D is a game where that literally happens every single time you play. And so what powerful opportunity is for young people to see their civic agency enacted in the magical world of Dragonlance, Forgotten Realms, Planescape, any of these other spaces, and then allow them to think through, if I have these capacities to be a leader within this world, what might it mean to take those leadership capacities and move them outside of the world? If I know how to emote, uh, if I know how to engage emotionally within this space and build powerful friendships, how might I move those outside into the quote unquote real world, right? I, I, I quibble with the real versus fake um, or fictional, um, but, and we can get into that because I think I think the relationships you create within the world of D and D are just as powerful as those that you might create around the table and outside of D and D. Um, but I'll stop there and see if um, Liz, Kate, or Stefan, if any of you'd like to add to that definition or some of your other thoughts around that, and then we'll we'll jump forward. I once heard um, a definition of D and D or RPGs in general, so role playing games, Dungeons and Dragons, as the DM or storyteller telling a story that the other players at the table try to survive. Now, that was definitely how my brother and his friends around the table played it, where the, um, the DM kind of set up this almost impossible challenge just to try and kill his friends. Um, but a lot of that is like choosing what kind of table you want to play at. Do you want to have a very adversarial game? Do you want to have a story where all you do is rescue animals and uh, rescue the princess or build a, uh, a, a great school or whatever it is? There's a kind of, uh, no matter what you're doing, whether the actual game on the table is adversarial or competitive or whatever, you are cooperative. Those five, six, seven people around the table you are doing this co cooperatively because much like with any other kind of improv or creation as you're going, the yes and 
or no, but like building off of what your fellows are, are doing. So that is a very important for middle school, for, for my students, um, it's very important to realize that there is a world outside of the thought that you had in your head about the game because your friend across the table also had an idea and your ideas are both just as valid and you need to cooperatively decide how you're going to make both of them happen, neither of them happen, whatever it may be. So that's kind of where I uh, focus a lot of the energy um, in, in our game. And that's kind of what I like to think about. Stefan, you got anything to throw in? I do, obviously, of course. Um, yeah, to build on that, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is synonymous with, with RPG. Uh, but what if you are neither interested in dungeons nor dragons? Like, what else can the game do? Um, and also speaking to, uh, can elementary stu students uh, access this, even special ed elementary students? And the answer to both is an overwhelming yes. The idea of of D and D and RPGs is that it's it's built on inclusivity. It's as easy as asking students or friends or peers what kind of world do you want to live in, and mostly what kind of experiences do you really want to have. And I think that's why we're all here and that's what we've all discovered is that RPGs and D&D excels at transforming education into an experience. And experiences are what creates that neuroplasticity. It's what connects the neurons in your brain to both what you're interested in as well as what you've already learned and how to connect all those different concepts and ideas together. Um, so in our program, we run, uh, I, I can't remember the last time I rolled a combat dice. Um, we, we run a program about terraforming an unknown planet we run a program about being a, a vampire traveling through history. Uh, we run a program, of course, about building a business from scratch. And neither of those do we ever roll a combat dice. So uh, it's about bringing your own passions and your own heart fire uh, and how you enjoy learning. And the kids will respond to that. Students will respond to that. They will mirror everything you bring to it. Your passions, your heart fire, your creativity, your sense of immersion, and your vulnerability. Everything you throw into it, you'll get out of it. Uh, for me, D and D is the definition. If we're defining it, it's like lifeblood. <laughs> um, it, I don't even know the person that I would be without it. My life would be so dramatically different. I will define it in two ways. The first way that I'll define it is it's living in a book that's not written yet. It's living in a book that's being written. Everybody's got a role. Um, <clears throat> that's that's the easiest definition that I can think of. If I was explaining it to someone who had absolutely no idea what it is, it's like you're playing a character in a book and the book is being written while you sit at the table. Um, the other thing that I would say as a defining agency is it's the single greatest educational tool I've seen for at least English in my life as an educator, like literally the best educational tool I've seen as a standalone item, um, better than any curriculum that I've seen in a long time. So it's, it's living a book and it's a, a, a fantastic, phenomenal educational, uh, supplement. Awesome. I love it. And I'll just, I just want to acknowledge that in the chat, there's been so many other kinds of um, versions of D&D &D and forks uh, that people have been sharing. Uh, Snakes and Saloons for Wild West D&D. &D. Um, Pathfinder is the kind of um, a, another spinoff of a recent version of, of the game, right? Uh, a Star Wars adaptation, Spelljammer. Uh, so just, you know, anything that you could imagine D&D &D might be, right, to, to Stefan's point of what, what if Dungeons and Dragons, but no Dungeons nor Dragons, right, I think is a useful starting point of what's it mean to engage in collaborative storytelling, right, with the people around you in whatever world you want it to be, right? I think that just seems, just to, um, to Liz's recognition of the yes and, right, I think if we can just start with the very basic speculative what if, right, is a nice kind of place to begin. Um, and yeah, you, there are cool dice, I, I think, uh, when I was a kid and I got into D and D, I think the the weird, funky dice that you use um, were were you know the, they were the talismans that kind of pulled me and they they pulled me into this game. Um, but you don't need those, right? You could you could play without any. And there's you know there's entire systems where you don't use any dice or you just use D six, as someone mentioned, GURPS, or you might just use um, fate cards or fate tokens, right? Or fate dice, right? You could think through all the different kinds of things you might use instead. Um, One of the best classes I ran, we used a Jenga tower instead of dice. Ah, yeah, there's a, is, is Dread one of the role-playing games where you use, right. use yeah. uh, Jenga? Dread yeah. is one, it, yeah, and there's, yeah. A, there's a bunch. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about using a Jenga tower is that it builds in suspense. And so a lot of times that comes from uh, like the, how your story is progressing, the words that you're using, all of that. 
But when you're all, you also immediately are cooperating. Yep. Immediately, because you all can physically see as the story goes along. Um, one thing that um, I, I wanted to mention just is like, so, so Jenga works as like everybody very clearly takes a turn or there's very specific things. And, and some of my students in my club, they are, they might have pl educational plans or emotional uh, service, like services that they may be needing. And so one of the ways that we do, and I was, I'm, I'm about to say SEI, which is social, social emotional um, interventions or things like that, um, where we're actually teaching students how to interpret what their fellow students are doing and what they're supposed to be doing at a specific moment. D&D um, &D has specific roles for what you're supposed to do because we all know, all four of us know that when I say roll initiative, you all have like three things that you're going to do. You know that you're going to pick up your D20, you're going to roll it, you're going to add a, a modifier to it. You know, like all of this. And don't worry, anybody who's listening is like, I don't know what you're talking about. This. I'll explain. But for those students, you, you'd be in the same place as that student who's never heard about what's initiative. What am I doing rolling? Which of these seven little plastic things am I supposed to roll now? And like, what am I doing? And so there's a lot of um, uh, ritual that goes into it, sure. Because if, if, if I get Cade rolling a, a 20 and I'm suddenly cheering and you're sitting there, why is rolling a 20 the best thing that you can possibly do? Like, I know it's the biggest number, but why is everyone so excited and like clapping me on the back? There's a lot of things that go into that. And so it's a really great way of having kind of a not like not a lot of pressure, but getting a social situation that's got just a little bit of rules that can kind of help students that that might be a challenge for. And yes, Joseph, I just saw somebody come in with the same kind of idea. So maybe, maybe we jump into uh... The, the heart of <laughs> uh, the heart of what this this webinar is supposed to be about because I think I think Liz that's where you're heading us towards right um, and so we're we're talking about social emotional learning we're gonna, we're probably gonna um, say SEL uh, for for much of this the rest of this time um, uh, so when we talk about social emotional learning right what does uh, D and D embody or what's it teach in terms of uh, the opportunities that that might be embedded within the game, and so I'm curious to hear from from all of you. And maybe I'll jump to you, Stefan, to, to start us off uh, in a second. Um, for me, I, I just want to recognize that I think I think D and D, in order to role play and to take on this other identity, it is it, it is inherently an empathetic act, right? You need to imagine what this other person, this fictional person, is feeling as a way to begin to embody and begin to think through what these practices look like, right? Um, someone had a question around how this might engage with multilingual learners. I, I wanna get back to that question later, but I just wanna recognize that even trying to put into words, right, the kinds of emotions that I'm feeling um, is the kind of powerful literacy practice that we're talking about across all of these different domains. Um, so Stefan, I don't know if you, wanna, if you wanna pick it up from there and then we'll go kind of reverse order of Stefan, Cade, and then Liz. Sure, and feel free to cut me off. I start rambling here because um, this is really, like you said, the, the heart of it. Uh, but I, I have a rule when I'm when I'm designing these experiences, and it's that fulfilling a learning objective should always result in a pleasurable experience. And I think that is one thing that education, uh, as we know it, denies denies kids most of the time. And so we employ what I call our AAA framework, and that's agency, abstraction, and additive feedback. And that's, that's built into RPGs like TNT. Agency being ownership where, where students have control over their own learning journey. That can be things like uh, putting skin in the game, developing their own group culture uh, and world building. The big one with D&D is character creation. Um, a, a large part of that in, in elementary students, that's, that's tough for them, they can't get too complex. But one thing we focus on is called min-maxing, which is maximizing your strengths and minimizing your weaknesses that creates specific roles and strength that they are identified by and then everybody else fills in the gaps. And so you always have someone saying, uh, I'm really strong at this, but I'm weak in this. And someone else throws out, oh, I'm great at that, but I can't do this. And then someone jumps in and says, oh, that's my thing, I got this. Um, and that's great, that creates bonds. That's, that creates the, the collaborative and cooperative storytelling. Um, I know Kate, Kate can speak to uh, a role, job, task economy that he employed in this classroom that is that's brilliant. 
Um, it also informs personalized rewards, like rare items, souvenirs, special missions. Um, and then with abstraction, that's more like self-expression. I think you were, you were talking about the, the make-believe world or the separate world in games, we call that the magic circle. And that's the distance between uh, the world of imagination that they're living in in this game and the real world. And for students, especially suffering uh, trauma-informed education, uh, that, that creates a cushion or a buffer where creative, introverted students can try things, they can experiment with self-expression, they can become someone else for a little bit. We use, we make all of our students employ a sacred wound. So whenever they develop a, a character, they have to create their, uh, their sacred wound that, that informs who, where this character came from and what they're trying to heal in the world and heal in themselves as they go along their journey. And then the last one is added the feedback, which is just essentially productive failure. Uh, failure in, in the school system right now is, is more closer to futility, right? But failure is really a stepping stone to success. It's implicit in science and games allow you, failure in games means you, you start over, you continue counting up, you continue to grow and you continue to reiterate. And it's remapping their language from, I can't do this, to, oh, I've got to figure out a different way to do this. And play-based discovery is, is wonderful at that. Liz, you're up. I am, and honestly, I, I don't know, because I, I, I talked so much before about all of this, but I, I was kind of like, oh, is there anything more? But I do actually, because uh, you all talked a lot about in-game, and one thing that out of game, I always find is sometimes a struggle when a new student joins the club is uh, they are so excited to finally play D&D that they just want to play D&D right away. And they don't know necessarily how to have that like five or 10 minutes of kind of like everybody getting settled, pulling out your sheet, pulling out your dice, chatting about like what you want to do this session or what happened last session. Um, and so one of the things that I actually learned from the Adams who uh, run Game to Grow, which is an organization out West, um, is actually having a very structured beginning so that uh, we sit down, have a question for the day that's like a little chat, uh, and then get everybody ready to go. So when the D and when the DM is ready to go, and it's not always me, I should say. Sometimes it's, we have student DMs. I have other teachers who DM, just depending on um, what we're what we're doing, what group we're in, whatever. Um, when the DM is ready to go, there's specific things that they'll do so that they know. Uh, the students know when to get started uh, and when it's time because I do have some students who do not know that we're expecting maybe to have a little comfortable chat because we've just left class because I'm also an after school program so you know it's 310 and he's like no I want to play it's 312 I'm here I've got my dice I've got my computer so I have D&D &D Beyond up I'm all set it's like, no, actually, we're probably going to wait until about 3.20 because we have to get everybody in and we have to settle, which, you know, some people have to decompress a little bit. And those kinds of things, those kinds of lessons, I'm never uh, putting like a goal to this. This is completely out of school. None, no one's uh, tutor is there. No one's ABA or ACBA tutor is there. We're not counting anything. I'm just giving them a situation that's not quite school, but it's not quite home to practice some things that they can then turn around and use in the real world. And it is wonder. And again, it is the real world, but it's also uh, giving them expectations that they can meet. Uh, and then it's really great to see them by the end of, you know, eighth grade. Uh, I have a lot of very social kids who know just a little bit about how to uh, express themselves. Uh, with a, at least a small group. Yeah. Um, I have a ridiculous amount of experience with the socio-emotional learning component of Dungeons and Dragons, having been able to use it in class so extensively, I've gotten to see things that will literally just make you cry. Um, I'm gonna tell two quick stories as fast as I can because I think they do encompass the gambit of the socio-emotional learning literacy component of the game. I'm going to start here currently where I where I teach now. Um, I have a group of seventh graders, had a group, they're going to be eighth graders next year, had a group of seventh graders this year who were shut down in March of their fifth grade year 
due to pandemic. They went home, they stayed home. Um, maybe a friend or two was vetted for that summer to hang out, but they really apparently, very apparently lacked the type of socialization that we were very used to, right? Like they, like the girls came in, they went to one side of the room, the boys came in, they went to the other side of the room. And I kind of looked around and thought, well, this is weird. But then I thought, well, it's going to be fine because they're all going to make characters and they have no idea that their whole class is about to be juggled by character class so they can play this game. And that ends up being their seating chart. So it was really strange to watch how oddly and awkwardly they were because even when they came back to school masked up the next year, they still, you know, we were all at distance and all of the social functions were shut down. You couldn't go to sporting events unless you were, you know, whatever. There were so many stipulations that stunted their socialization as uh, humans in a group as like the herd animal that we really are that you could tell there's there had to be something to be done and so to make that story short by the end of the year um, the boys and the girls had a much plainer discourse I saw it happen very slowly through gaming it wasn't like oh D&D is going to fix everything super magically it took a little bit of time but you could see it work I could see it work and then by the end of the year when they had any kind of free time or group activities, they would go and pair up with somebody that I, I, I know they never would have paired up with that person had they not played D&D with them for the entire year for 36 sessions, I think is what we get. And so that uh, comfort level that it brings to kids, they get really used to, you know, a little bit of talk has happened about um, the shy kid. You know, I've seen the shy kid become like a, a, foot, a fo football quarterback in my classroom because they're the dungeon master. All the kids enjoy the game. They respect that care that kid's agency as the guy who makes or girl because I have both that makes that story run. And um, here, the sweet little nerd, you know, who never knew they were going to have an agency in the world, all of a sudden has this uh, almost rock star like status, you know. And you watch them uh, develop socially and emotionally in a way that is so rewarding because you know that that kid would have been stuck inside of themselves at some point. Um, there's lots. There's lots more to that. I'm going to cut back to about six years ago when I was in Houston. And this is where <clears throat> it gets really deep. And so I'll do my best to not choke up. But uh, I was a department chair of English and I was able to pull kids for uh, a 90 minute session uh, three times a week. And I asked my English teachers, my English team to identify kids that needed this. Like they knew me. We had worked really well. We were a great gelling team, very creative. So they did. From each of these reading classes, they pulled a kid and I pulled them all together. And what I discovered there is what led us here. I mean, like, it was just incredible. So one of the most impactful stories there was uh, a kid that I had whose parents were murdered in front of him. He was from Honduras. His parents were murdered in front of him with a machete. He naturally, uh, he came to live with his aunt and his uncle in Houston, and he didn't want to do anything in school. I can't imagine why. So he was disengaged. He would sleep. He had a lot of problems. He didn't sleep well at night. Um, and it was it was sad because he was a really gentle boy. Well, he was super good at filling out a character sheet, right? Like these kids, they were not strong readers. They're not strong learners. I pulled them for those specific reasons. And here he was, an, an ESL kid, English as a second language, and had the trauma from what he experienced as a young boy. And he, he would write things, anytime they could get him to write, he would write really dark things. Like, I just want to go hang myself in the tree that's in the backyard in Honduras and just be done. And after about two weeks of playing D&D, &D, um, his aide from his reading room came to me and call, caught me in the hallway. And I was having kind of a tough day because it's a tough environment for anybody who's worked in those environments. It, it really, you eat it a lot. You soak it in. And she put her hand on my arm and she said, what did you do to be? And I said, well... You know, I, she, she was always like so hard to read and I thought she was mad. And, and I said, well, we've been playing this game called Dungeons and Dragons. And she said, he is a changed boy. He doesn't sleep in class. He raises his hand. He goes and helps other students. He has realized how bright he is. He was brighter than any kid that I pulled for that group. And I just watched as he became this brilliant, capable, gentle voice of helpfulness and reason for his classmates. And uh, knowing what he had been through and the challenges of language acquisition and watching them both be solved at the same time by playing a silly game was enough residence for me to say, well, this, this is probably the greatest learning tool that anybody's going to find. And kind of on that same vein, and sorry to go on, um, people are always trying to create the best edu game in the world, but all of us nerds know that they're all taken from the same source, which is Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is the original edu game. 
by its very nature. And so everybody's always trying to pull the greatest parts from it, as I have done as well. And then I realized there's this perfect system with professionals who've been writing it for five editions. Why am I going to reinvent the wheel when the wheel is right there? And um, so the socio-emotional learning guys, for whatever it's worth to you, I mean, I could tell you a hundred stories, but those two are our two opposite demographics. Language learners, I had a kid who was dyslexic. He couldn't read. He wanted to be a wizard. I told him it's going to be really hard, dude. He's like, I can do it, Mr. Wells. So I was like, okay, you want to be a wizard, be a wizard. You're going to have to study. Okay, so what does he do? He prints off the spells. He highlights the spell that he gets on the thing. He did a whole bunch of like learner preparation for this. And we had a new student join and uh, he didn't know his spells because he was a bard. And he's like, oh, I'm going to cast a spell magic. I'm not sure what it does. And this other kid uh, opened up the book and read the spell out loud, which previous would have been absolutely impossible. This kid could barely read a sentence at a time. And so here he was reading a whole spell description for his buddy. Um, and on and on and on these stories go, uh, family, like it is absolutely incredible. I've seen this game literally change kids' lives and save kids' lives. I honestly think for V, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know what would have happened to him. And all of a sudden he had a group of people that he could trust and believed in and he, he liked coming to school and um, his aunt and uncle ended up, <laughs> ended up coming to spring conferences. I'm really sorry. This is so real for me. You know, I'm living it right in that moment when I'm recanting this. So anyway, um, his, his aunt and uncle said that that you have forever changed his life and, and thank you so much. And so there's just two anecdotes that that instantly come to mind about the socio-emotional learning. And for language learners, there's been a string about, a string about that. Um, I can't think of a better tool, honestly, because the speaking, reading, uh, writing, and listening loop that it takes to gain those skills is in constant uh, effect during a gameplay of Dungeons and Dragons um, to varying degrees, you know, depending on, on what you're doing at that time. But speaking and listening, of course, for a language learner are what you really, really need to really soak in the language. And then that's supported with the reading. And then the, I always have writing projects that are involved with the game as well. And so that loop is really what helps create the language acquisition process. And I've seen it do, I'm going to call them miracles. I love that, Kate. Thanks. I, I just want to recognize, you know, Part, part of, I think, what's so powerful about this is the complexity. So if we think about what the reading piece of this, so if we set aside the SEL piece for a second, if we think about the complexity of a rule book, so, you know, the D&D &D Player's Handbook is, you know, 300-ish pages of, that does a couple of different things. It sets us, it sets out the world, so it can be kind of an atlas. It's supposed to teach you how to play the game, so it's something of a tutorial, and it's something of an index, right? You need to look up all of the spells, you look up how much things cost, you look up how much, what kinds of weapons there are, um, and so you have this one book that's supposed to do, uh, it's like a tech, it's the size of a student's textbook, right? Um, mm -hmm. Has just as many words uh, and is just as unwieldy to some extent, but students willfully kind of go through it, right? And I think it's, it's just incredible to think about how complex, and this is, so this is the literacy researcher geek in me, right? Like how complex the writing and literacy practices are. And if we think through what the writing and what the reading looks like, it is us kind of communicating, negotiating. So it might be as I'm moving my character for using maps, I might say, I'm going to be right here. And Liz might say, actually, you're standing on uh, you're standing on a rock right there. There's actually a hole. You just can't see it. And so you have to say, oh, what if I'm over here? There's this ongoing negotiation. I think of the, the um, there's a book that's a conversation between Paulo Freire and Miles Horton called We Make the Road by Walking. And I think about this as the kind of ways of how we kind of construct our meaning around us, right? We make the road by walking. We do this together. Um, feels like a really useful way to think about what these literacy practices look like um, in person. I'm going to combine two questions together here um, just for the sake of time. And I want to think through for the three of you, what did it look like uh, as you were trying to establish this within your various school settings, so after, as an after-school club within your school, and at the same time, have you gotten pushback from teachers, from students, uh, from administrators, right? Like, wh where has skepticism come in? How have you talked about that? I think the getting started part of this oftentimes can feel um, a little shy. Like, I can see in the chat, there's a lot of people who are D&D &D enthusiasts who'd love to do this in their classrooms, but might feel reticent. Um, and so, Liz, I wonder, I wonder if you might start us with the kind of, like, out-of-school context and, and then what it looks like within your classroom is maybe a starting place? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I first, uh, so I, I kind of did this um, kind of hand in hand with becoming a teacher, actually, uh, because I was learning how to play D&D &D at the same time that I was learning how to be a librarian. Um, and by the way, um, because I'm a nerd, I looked it up and um, Dungeons and Dragons books go at 793.93 in the Dewey Decimal System, which is adventure games, uh, tabletop adventure games. So in case anyone was wondering, any librarians out there, 
Um, they go before the team sport and after chess. Um, but anyway, uh, I basically, I got into um, wanting to have some kind of a club, after school club that kids in my town who didn't like sports were kind of um, not served to the extent that uh, they could have there was the liter the literature magazine and then there was like uh, robotics and if you weren't really into that or you you didn't really have a creative thought you didn't think you had a creative side uh, you didn't have anything and at the same time critical role was talking about this uh, organization called 826 LA and there's 826 Boston and all these things it's creative writing um, and they were talking about how they would volunteer and it, my little head just goes, well, I've just gotten all of this great confidence in being a teacher because I've been playing D&D &D with my, my friends. I've been learning how to do this. What if this confidence building I'm doing as a teacher would help my students? Because it turn, turns out actually D&D is really good to help be a teacher and talk in front of people. Who knew? Um, and I'm re very good at improv now. Um, and... I just I reached out to some of my friends who were already teachers and had already done some of this. And I talked I, I talk in school about it. Honestly, there was just a bunch of people who didn't actually know that much about D&D because as I mentioned, I live in a sports town and, and I work in a sports town. This wasn't that uh, thing. But when I said like SEL, you say the magic words, it's like we can probably get some kids to want to do this. And I was so lucky because I had... A boy moved from Israel who didn't, who wouldn't speak any English, but he loved Harry Potter and he loved magic. And magic cards, which are also produced by Wizards of the Coast and are fantastic, are very complex. And he did not have uh, Hebrew D &D, or, uh, magic cards. He had English magic cards. So he actually spoke English at a very high level when he would actually speak, but he didn't have anything he wanted to speak about because he wanted to be home in Israel where he had been for the last 12 years of his life. And his dad picked him up to go to, to work as a professor in Boston. And he's like, ah, I'm grumpy all the time. So we found him a, a couple of Harry Potter books in Hebrew and I found him some magic cards and I found him a bunch of kids who would play magic during lunch. And then lunch went to, we have team time, which is this time where you can meet with your teachers. And that came down and we came down into the library because we couldn't have it in the classroom anymore because two kids had become four kids, had become eight kids. And then I had, I'm not joking, 32 at one point, 35 kids all come to me, Miss Simpson, we want to play magic. I'm like, I don't have enough cards for you. And then I had to reach out to all my friends and get a whole bunch of, uh, and my friends at Wizards of the Coast also, because they have wonderful things where you could write in and you could get a whole big box of starter packs and things like that. That was wonderful. Uh, teachers can do that and it's fantastic. Um, and I started the club that way. And I just kind of inched my way in. Because as my principal saw, um, the students who started speaking more, started uh, participating more in class, started being like smiling in the hallway and had friends and were doing things after school, all these kinds of things that we've been talking about, they started realizing that even if they didn't understand what D&D &D was all about, and they had no idea, if I had a student drop in my lap, that student would excel somehow. I would find a way. Mm -hmm. And I found teachers who knew about magic or knew about uh, uh, LARPing, didn't know anything about D&D, &D, weren't interested in D&D, &D, but knew what LARPing was. So I was able to communicate with them and kind of get them to start going on it. It was great. Um, and now uh, we're an after-school program where I have 30 kids playing D&D &D and I have student DMs and it's just amazing. So. Uh, and I've already graduated my first, my pandemic students, like I, as I call them, because um, they went home 
March 17th in 2020. And they graduated last year or from eighth grade. Um, some of them were like the quiet kids in the back. They never talked to anybody. And now they, they're going off to high school excited as all can get out. And I have to take a little credit for that. Just a little. Because we had clubs for uh, at home, even online. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Kate or Stefan? Go ahead, Steph. I'll, I'll approach it from, I mean, it's undeniable what, what DMV programs have done, done for our students. Uh, I'll approach it from, a, if, if you're fearful of it or if it sounds overwhelming, how do you start? Uh, I Before, before the, the, my students approached me, I had never cracked open a book of DMV. I, I knew of it. A lot of, I had a lot of friends. I'm, I grew up in geek culture and nerd culture. My dad played. Uh, but I'd never, I'd never myself played a game of it. Um, and I, I've never read through the entire rule book. I've never opened a lore book of D&D. &D. There's, there's tons of resources out there, both branded and otherwise. Liz mentioned Critical Role. There's podcasts. Uh, there's lots of starter kits out there. Speak to friends who, who know of it or play it. But you don't, you don't have to immerse yourself in the culture of D&D necessarily to decide what it means to you and what it looks like. It's as easy as asking the kids what kind of games they want to play. I saw some questions about Afrofuturism and the Civil War. If, you, if you're interested in that stuff, you bring that passion, you bring that knowledge base, kids will engage with it. Absolutely, 100%. And the ways in which you learn and why you love learning about that and how you love learning that, you throw that into the game, you, you world build that way, and they will engage. And I will, I will say it's so much easier to play D&D with kids than adults. I always say that uh, it's easier to teach kids how to be more mature than to teach adults how to be less mature. And I've played probably 90% of my my D, D with kids. And now when I play with adults, I'm bored because they just don't access or immerse in the same way that kids do. So I, I don't think you'll regret it at all. As long as you you throw your full self into it, you're vulnerable, you get creative, you bring your own passions to it, uh, then then it, it'd probably be no brainer at that point. Uh, integration of D and D and kickback. So yes, yes, kickback. Yes. Um, it has been a thing and it's not going to be a thing anymore. Um, I've had to be very bold, um, in conversations with people, uh, to defeat ignorance, uh, really as, as what, what other battle is there really besides defeating ignorance in our whole lives as human beings, we're always trying to help enlighten anyone to see a point of view. Um, I integrated it into my room because I knew it was amazing and I had data that I could show from Houston especially. Um, I didn't get as much kickback in Houston because they just hoping the kids pass the star test and my kids were, were already achieving at a much higher rate. Um, we're, we've been talking a lot about uh, how beneficial it is for kids, but I want to take about 30 seconds here and say I just trained 12 teachers how to play D&D for their continuing education credit and it has changed the way that I, I mean, I've been playing my whole life, but I know that my classroom environment emulates those skills as a dungeon master and a lifelong player. So we do product-based learning. Like my kids are always making something in English. They're never filling in a line on a workbook. In fact, I won't let it happen unless there's some rudimentary skill that's clearly missing. Um, they're always going to make something. They're going to be researching. They're going to be writing. They're going to be building something, which very much emulates the character creation process and so forth. So having just happen, you can't just have the kids learn. Having teachers learn, I'm going to argue is equally important if you really want your game to run fluidly in your classroom to expect that you're going to have kids play in D&D &D and you don't know how to play uh, or that you're going to get to take a day off because they're all busy or whatever. That's not going to be the case at all. You have to be involved in what they're doing. So integrating into my class, I just used the previous data. Um, but as I was doing it in Houston, I did it slowly for specialist groups. You know, I didn't I didn't get to play uh, every Friday, like I do here, uh, until you know I was about to leave, and then I, through administration, I showed them scores, showed them the anecdotal proof of the kids that I was polling for, you know, uh, various reasons, and I did that for three years, and those kids uh, all passed their star test. Um, at one point, I took D and D club kids in Houston and put them into a reading class with really low readers, and like ninety percent of those kids all passed their star test. So even just having group members 
it, there's something really magical about it that happens, but the data is always your proving point, and the data is starting to speak for itself after 10 years of doing this now. So um, when I got here, I wanted to play every Friday. I knew the kids would be excited. I knew the parents would be questionable. I, you know, I didn't know what my administrator would say. My, princi my building principal is a lifelong D&D nerd, thank God. So he's like, you go, dude, like they actually, he specifically hired me in my interview because of the things that I was saying. And he said, my, my son is going to be in, in your sixth grade class on the year that I was arriving. So very, very, very supportive there. Um, but I, I did receive a, a number of strange, you know, a strange parents that, that were just not sure. This is the advanced cohort. They're very well monitored by their parents. Um, helicopters come to mind. And uh, they want to know that, that their kids are receiving the absolute best education that's possible. And this Dungeons and Dragons nonsense, I'm just not so sure. And they're difficult conversations to have. But when their kids go home super excited and their scores go up, you know, it's like, what, how, what, what are we arguing about now? Like, your kid's getting smarter and they're excited. So your problem is what exactly? So they're worried that these kids are not getting rudimentary skills by playing this game. They've never played this game before. So they have literally no idea that it's written in a 1400 Lexile, that the vocabulary that a kid will learn even just during character creation is phenomenal for whatever grade level. I don't care if you're a senior in high school, having strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma to be able to define a person within 10 seconds um, is, is a fabulous skill for anyone to be able to have. And so once you have sort of the common language being shared amongst groups of gamers, um, the level of communication goes up dramatically because you can actually shorthand a lot of things that other people would have to take 10 minutes to explain, whereas a two D&D players would be like, oh, dude, that guy's neutral evil. He only cares about himself. Don't trust him. And so, again, we go into the real-life component of, of what it can do. So, yeah, you're going to receive kickback, but that's because they're approaching you from a, a position of ignorance, and you have to be strong in – your, your confidence of it is the right thing to do. I've been using D&D in the classroom for 10 years because it is literally the right thing to do. It, I, I realized that nothing was gonna be better than this. And when you face something with passion like that and back it up with data, you might have to go through it a couple of different times and then you're gonna get released hopefully, or they're just gonna tell you no and you look for a different job. I mean, I don't, I don't really know what to say there if they're absolutely, um, you know, absolutely no in the line in the sand, but most of it's just because they don't know. And so I've had an administrator um, in Houston. I handed her a player's handbook and a character sheet. And I said, this is what they, she was seeing the kids play. And she was like, what are they doing? What is this? What is this? And I said, this, they're playing D&D. &D. And she's like, oh, what do you mean? And she was really upset. And I handed her a player's handbook and a character sheet. And I said, this is all they had to do to get started. Go ahead and do it. And it stopped her dead in her tracks. She looked at the, she opened the book and she looked at this character sheet, which is a graphic organizer on steroids. You know, it's a crazy graphic organizer. And very, very quickly, that ignorance was uh, was sated. And, and she began to realize why it was what it is. And so that would be another piece of advice that I have. If you have resistance, invite them in. Give them a player's handbook. Give them a character sheet. Show them the Monster's Manual, the Dungeon Master's Guide, any of the supplemental materials that the Katasha's, you know, all of the supplemental books that my kids are digging through on a regular basis at 1400 leg style. And they do it in their leisure time. Okay, so there's like an advisory period before school. It's 20 minutes long. My kids will come in and immediately go to a book, uh, a player's handbook, a, a new supplement, whatever, Tasha's Cauldron or Xanthar's or whatever it is. And they're reading these very difficult task texts to make their characters better. So um, the proof is really in the pudding. Um, defeating the ignorance is a matter of conversation. And you want to be kind of, I don't want to say punchy, but you got to be, stay, you got to stand, stand up to, you know, stand up with your guns and not be, you know, meek about it because, you know, you got to know that what you're doing is the right thing and how powerful it is. That probably went on too long. I apologize. I'm done. That was great. Um, I want to I want to shout out a few resources that I've heard from folks, and then we're going to do some some wrap up here, just because there's and I feel like, I feel like this this webinar should have been um, uh, either in combat time, so it just slows down, uh, or uh, we we should have had just like nine hours uh, to engage with this, like a regular campaign length maybe. Um, but, you know, it, there's just been a ton of amazing resources that have been in this chat. So if, if you're on the Zoom, um, please take a look. I want to shout out uh, a friend, uh, Dr. Karis Jones, um, has adapted, um, I don't know if it was D&D, &D, Karis, please, please correct in, in the chat, um, but role-playing games specifically around Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Uh, and I think some really nice kinds of adaptation work as, and some other articles are, are in that as well. Other adaptations are there as well. Um, in my own work looking at literacy practices, I've thought about the ways that reading and writing transplace across three different dimensions in tabletop role-playing games. So it happens within the game. So you have a character who might 
um, speak a language that does not exist in the quote unquote real world or might read a magical spell that doesn't actually have magical powers outside of the real world. Those are literacy acts that are happening that we are imagining. They're happening within the game. Um, we also have the reading that's happening at the table. That's the rule books. That's the record keeping. That's the negotiating of space. That's us talking at the table. And then we have the beyond the table literacy stuff that's also happening all the time, right? So right before this webinar started, Cade was showing off the terrain that he makes, right? He's making um, tabletop terrain. Um, someone might be into cosplaying. Um, you might be painting figurines, right? Like all of these other kinds of things. You might be going to conventions, all of the nerdy talk about Firefly, right? All of this stuff is tied to our, our practices and our identities, right? So we have the beyond the table, at the table, and within the game is different kinds of ways to think through, you know, what's happening constantly across uh, all these literacy spaces. I also just want to recognize that there is no panacea. There's no magic bullet for the kinds of uh, generations of inequities that are facing public schools in, in the United States right now. And so, you know, one one D and D campaign is not going to transform um, the the state of public education right now, um, but it is going to transform young people's lives. It may not transform every single single student, right? There's a lot of um, uh, skepticism that you might be facing, uh, and we also are in a place where it's more popular than ever, right? I think we can look at things like um, you know all of the Marvel superheroes and all of the Stranger Things and all of the Game of Thrones as a moment where we are in this Renaissance period where it is not just nerds and basements, although, you know, I think that these are, these might be where, where many of us are, are affiliating, um, but everybody can, can, should, and can see themselves as playing in these games. And so this is just a real opportunity for us to kind of work together and think through what this could look like. Um, I have I think, oh, please, go ahead. I have a little point to, uh, to you know, right along that vein. Um, there's a, uh, an effect call it, I call the Susie Q effect. And Susie Q has always been able to fill in a blank like a boss. She's always <laughs> done really good on tests. She raises her hand at every opportunity and, and, and pl implodes herself into every possible thing in the classroom. And she has always been rewarded for this. She's Susie Q. She's amazing. Just ask her. And you hand them a character sheet in a player's handbook and say, make your character. You got a bunch of reading to do. And they look at you like you're insane, like they don't know what to do. And they're immediately panicked, immediately panicked because there isn't this straight line. I fill in the blank. I look the thing up. I can take the test. It isn't like that. It's actually real learning. So Susie Q struggles with this because she's never actually had to do it, despite the fact that she's this great, great student. Then Susie Q says, well, why do we have to do this? I don't understand it. I don't, they don't say they don't understand it, but they're like, I don't understand why this is important at all. This is, this is an education. This is, so you will, you may have the student, I call her Susie Q because it's always a Susie Q. It's either a boy or a girl, but the, the mentality is the same. But then you go to Susie Q and you say, hey, Susie Q, look at Timmy. And Timmy's that kid who hated everything, is never engaged in learning, has never wanted to learn, never enjoyed a minute of school in his life. And suddenly Timmy has got his character sheet built out, his tongue sticking out, and he's filling stuff out, he's flipping pages, and he's got the smile on his face. And you can tell Susie Q, don't you think it's Timmy's turn? Like, isn't it Timmy's turn to be completely engaged in learning? Well, it takes a little while for Susie Q to understand actually what's happening, but eventually that does happen. So, um, you know, it's like to say that every student is going to like absolutely love this is, is a farce. It's not true. Um, you know, I, at conferences, I'm often asked the question like, well, what do you do about the resistant student? And then I always say, well, what do you do with the resistant student in class during regular instruction? You know, like, yeah. it's just a different student really is the only difference. Now you got the high end kid who's like, I don't understand why we have to do this. And you got the low end kids who are becoming brilliant. And then pretty soon the high-end students like, oh, okay, so I guess I can see why this is a thing and they fold in. So I just wanted to segue into that a little bit, intro. Thanks, kid. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to wrap us up here just because we are at time. Uh, it, it doesn't feel like it, but we are. And so I just want to thank all of the presenters. Uh, this, this is going to be available as an online video uh, that you'll be able to access in a few days at literacyworldwide.org backslash digital events. Um, I also want to thank the sponsor of this webinar, Wizards of the Coast. Um, and so I'm just gonna make sure I get through all of these other things. We have a bunch of other uh, workshops related to this. Our next event, Leveling Up Reluctant Readers with Dungeons and Dragons is gonna be held August 9th uh, from five to six. Uh, registration for that is available now. Uh, same place that you probably registered for this, literacyworldwide.org backslash digital events. In addition, the third event in the series, Using Dungeons and Dragons to Scaffold Writing Instruction, will be held on October 11th from five to six Eastern as well. Uh, more info information is gonna come uh, soon. Also, if you're looking for stuff around emotional literacy in the classroom, join us on August 24th from 5 to 6 Eastern for our webinar on literacy coaching for SEL. Join J. Helen Perkins and Crystal D. Cook to gain strategies and resources that you can use to support SEL-embedded literacy instruction across the curriculum. 
Um, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate getting to talk with all of you. Liz, Cade, Stefan, thank you so much for the work you're doing in your classrooms and for sharing it with all of us. Uh, and I look forward to talking to with all of you again soon.